uh, talked a lot about how to sort of structure it, and uh, one of the things we thought would be good to sort of start today is just to talk about the major themes of the exhibition and um, of Valeska's work, of course. Uh, it's, uh, we're still a little rusty on uh, taking people through the show. I've taken a couple groups through, um, and so we're also going to open it up to questions afterwards. Uh, so save your questions until then. Um, so uh, the, the work in the exhibition, uh, first of all, this exhibition actually is your second survey exhibition in Alaska, um, as, as you know, but many of you don't. Um, her first uh, survey exhibition was actually at the Bronx Museum of Art in 2003-2004, and it traveled to Mexico and to Canada. Uh, but it did not travel out to outside of New York City. And so this was sort of one of the reasons um, I wanted to do this show here. And I think Vanessa was attracted by uh, the idea of the exhibition as well. And I think that the Getty Pacific Standard Time Initiative was sort of a perfect uh, coincidence for us to be able to pull uh, this project together. Um, this particular exhibition is a survey um, it, I would say that uh, since the, the last survey exhibition, there are a lot more text pieces um, because Valeska started doing her text works um, sort of more rigorously after that. There are the binding series, uh, the edits, uh, the 4-2, uh, those text pieces. Um, and uh, the, the catalog actually will come out in October. Uh, we're at our second uh, round of edits, and uh, Vanessa actually has done a really great uh, job at writing about uh, the text pieces, and she will hopefully talk about that a little bit. Uh, but I just sort of wanted to introduce some of the major themes of the work, and uh, some of you going through the show have hopefully picked up on this yourself, and of course we don't want to be didactic in any way because uh, one of the main aspects of the work is that the viewer is allowed or encouraged to bring their own meaning to the work and that these objects actually act as triggers for things that are that only the viewer can process. Um, the themes, the major themes of the work have to do with time, the passing of time, memory, um, desire, uh, love, and uh, sometimes those types of things can be very difficult for an art historian <laughs> to talk about. Um, my essay for the catalog that will come out in October um, is largely about love because when I sat down with Valeska, one of the first things she said to me was, Julie, my work is about love. And um, it was sort of an interesting way to start a conversation about her work, but it's also, after working with her for several years now, it really stuck in my head. Um, th this idea of love and how the work actually does go through all these things. It goes through time, it deals with time, it deals with memory, um, it deals with loss in a way, sort of placement, displacement. But in the end, I, I do think it does come back to love and it comes back to this sort of positive uh, place, even though there are things that, that might bring some painful memories uh, for some. I think that it, it does have a sense of positivity about it, which I also think makes it quite unique in terms of um, you know your, your your stance and in comparison to other installation artists that are dealing with conceptual matters um, regarding similar topics. Well, I think my work is really concerned about subjectivity you know, and how you represent subjectivity. There's a lot of artists that are working with many political term themes. To me, desire and how you represent desire and love is a political matter. Um, you know, without subjectivity in the world and the way we deal with it, there's no way to move ahead. You know, so to me, although the work is not political, that it's a political banner in the sense of 
representing the style of feelings and putting them in the world. Although, you know, um, in a lot of the art history and contemporary context, uh, subjectivity has almost become obscene. You know, uh, the word sentimental has a very bad connotation to it when people refer to art. And so I think my work also tries to shatter those um, thresholds of what we can talk and what an artwork can be. And semantically try to reinvent these uh, words that I've used out of context. Um, I've been working for many, many years, so the work co you know, covers a huge range of <coughs> techniques. And people always ask me, so what is your media? <laughs> and I said everything, you know. Or the same thing that Julie asked me, or they come to the studio and say, what is your work that is about? So I always decide to say it's either nothing or love, because the work is not about one thing, it's about everything. And, you know, there's not, uh, we had this great conversation here about labels. <laughs> and my, you know, um, my disregard for explanations because how are we going to do a label with an explanation if there are so many of them? So either the show is going to be all about labels or we're just not going to have labels. Uh, so we decided just to give the basic information of every work because my major desire with the show was for people to engage with the work and not read about it. And we actually, I think Patsy from the Education Department, we're going to do a little, a nice project that's an afterthought guide of the exhibition. So people can write their own guides of the show after they see it, not before. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we plan the show in a way that people relate to it. Very clumsy. Um, so people can relate to the work in a more one-to-one um, -one and come up with their own stories. The idea of the work is to be a trigger for people's stories. Um, the director of the museum yesterday was quite, uh, was funny because he came to me and said, oh, everybody seems they're so happy with the show and I think it's so sad. There's so many sad ideas here. And I said, well, <laughs> maybe they'll be sad tomorrow. <laughs> you know, the work changes every day, so there's not one specific feeling to it. Maybe they're happy today, maybe tomorrow they'll be sad, maybe they will be nostalgic. So that's the whole point of it. It is funny, I, uh, I've been encouraging people to come down and see the video, and at the opening I was like, please, please go see it, go see it. And then someone came back up and said, oh, God, I really loved it, but that guy that was dancing and in the video, he was so creepy, the older guy. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> it just sort of says more about you than it does about. Yeah, but I think that's, I think art is a little bit like that. It's a mirror, you know. It reflects what our feelings in, towards the world. So we use it as a mediation to read and to create meaning and sort of reflect ourselves into, into it. So. I always think like uh, if you walk into a room and if you said that day and you see roses and you see this, you're going to read it completely different than if, as Larry said, everybody's very happy. <laughs> then we, you see it's a, it's a celebration. So it could be a, it's a celebration of emotion. So it could go either way. And without one, we don't have the other. 
And the other thing I also think, you know, which one of the things that Vanessa said that I think I like about what I do, and I think it's very interesting because it's very architecturally bound, contextually bound, and if I could come up with a metaphor, it's like I would think about each piece individually as a word, word, and then when you relate those, put those words together, they become paragraphs. So although the words will be the same in Phoenix, they will relate differently, and then they will create another paragraph, another text that will be read or felt differently. Yeah. I think um, I, I, that's one aspect of, of your thinking process that I find incredibly evocative. And I, I, what I wrote about in, in my catalog essay was um, really, uh, it's called Wordsmith. It's about Valeska as a conceptual poet um, and the way that she appropriates and deconstructs works of world literature uh, as found objects or ready-mades, and then invest them with new significance that we bring to them by subject subjective associations. Um, so I think that what you were just saying about how everyone brings a different mood to the piece, and everyone is mere different every <coughs> other day, is, is incredibly um, insightful. Um, I think that, uh, especially with the works of stairs, there's so many of the themes that are interwoven into the idea of language um, as a very plastic, a very malleable entity um, and kind of text made physical uh, so that you see it both verbally and visually at the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm doing anything new. I mean, my favorite writer, Holland Barnes, you know, and all the structuralist like text, it's about the reader. So whoever read it, it's the one who's making the story, no matter what story you know you try to say. So I think that is true of art as well, you know. And one of the things I really wanted to engage people in this exhibition is to have them I go to museums these days and I feel that people are very uh, afraid of interacting with the object or the art or whatever. They really feel that they need to be guided through or told what things are supposed to mean or what they are supposed to feel or, you know, what this is. And I think that's the opposite of what how things should work, you know. So this exhibition is built in a way I hope that people won't be afraid to engage with whatever is it that they sing, even if it's to say I don't understand anything, you know. I, there's a very funny story, I was actually put in a historical show because the curator told me he didn't have a clue <laughs> what I was doing. So I thought that was kind of brilliant because <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think we don't need to understand everything, you know, actually that's where the challenge is, um, that at least the challenge to me is with when I don't understand something, that's when it really catches me. And, you know, and I really feel that we need to exercise this more to be less patronized, you know, and being told what we're supposed to be looking at, what is supposed to be mean. It means what it means to you, you know, and it's uh, really like um, about engagement. It's interesting you say that because I think the first piece, I remember being aware of you and your work uh, through reading about it in the magazines, and then I did see the first piece of yours that I did see uh, was unrest, um, where you see it most often when you see the image. It's from that beautiful show that was at Greenberg Van Doren a number of years ago, and I, I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> I must say, you know, I look at a lot of work, and um, I think that often is the thing that uh, I, I find most interesting. Um, Artists, I think, are 
uh, art that I end up finding most interesting and most engaging is that way to me at first. It, even still, and I should be so jaded having women <coughs> so much work all the time. Yeah, I think we are like, um, I find, because we look at so much stuff all the time, I always find engaging things that are mysterious to me, yeah. you know, because otherwise they become very didactic or obvious or one-liner. Um, I also like this show, uh, it's, uh, to me, it's been, I've been dreaming about this for quite a while because most of the pieces that you see in the show they, they were created in isolation from one another, and they never been together. So most of these works were created in a very short period of time and left the studio, and I never saw them again. So one of my desires here were to put like this 15 years of, in a way, loss, <laughs> you know, of losing these pieces and together because they, when I thought of them or I made them, they, they were always interrelated, but I never saw them. They left the studio and never came back or were never even shown together. So this is the first time I was able to put on my pillows, you know, which were envisioned as a whole. They were envisioned as an exhibition, but because technically each one of those pillows took four years to get done, that's the only exhibition they could be shown together because it took, I don't know, 10 or 12 years to have all of them. And, you know, so all of these projects are super involved. And this is the first time I'm actually, you know, seeing them together and relating to one another, you know. And it's, to me, it's also a discovery, you know. Every day I walk into the exhibition, I find something else that I wasn't aware of before. And it's inspiring because, you know, we don't do things in isolation and it's a process. So to do one piece, I have to do another one and another one. It's just like walking, right? So seeing these things are very good and inspiring to me because then it shows me avenues to move forward. And another thing we never talk about, you know, which is part of the process, and I encounter in the show, is failure. You know, to move ahead and to succeed, you have to fail as well, unfortunately, or oh, fortunately. You know, like um, I had to thought about a piece for the show that it didn't work out, and I had to make a decision to let it go. So it is a failure in a sense, but it's a success in another because it taught me something which I will apply in another situation. So we shouldn't be, you know, like there's no such a thing as a perfect artist that has the perfect body of work, uh, the, you know. All of us, to be able to do amazing things, need to fail. And without failure, there is no, you know, process. Um, I wanted to ask you, Valeska, about, um, I think that as you walk in the show, I find it most interesting, and uh, many of you may have noticed that, of course, that you could find the wall labels, because <laughs> as far away from the work as possible, <laughs> upon Valeska's request. Um, <coughs> But uh, you come into the show, and usually a survey exhibition is, is chronological. Um, and I'm sort of speaking about time now. You come into this show, and some of the work that you encounter first is, is some of the most recent work that you've done. Granted, it's in conversation, and that was the idea of the show. And we all talked about that, and how that would be much, make much more sense and be much more desirable for all of us than, than to have something chronological. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, some of the more recent works are also some of those that haven't been written about 
you know, as much. In fact, um, many of them are from your last show at uh, Fortes de Loya and Gabriel. And um, I was wondering specifically if you could speak a little bit about the constellation pieces, the, the linen pieces. Well, that's what I was saying. Work is a process, and I, in a way, I'm very lucky or damned. Because, you know, um, I kind of like the way my life has been developing in the past few years, I'm always working on a project. So even now, talking from the stage, I have a show to open in three weeks, so I'm already working on something else. So here, even here, I mean, like the last piece on the show, the beds, they were done after the Fortes Vilasa show. So every two months, I come up with the poor, my poor assistant, you know, he wants to kill me because every two months I come up with something that it's different. So the, the show at Fortes has been evolving for a series of things. I mean, it's, it has to do with my, you know, interest in objects as a memory vessel for this idea of uh, collective subjectivity. They also come from the piece I did at the Jewish Museum, the, you know, Time Has No Shadows. I always have interest, I mean, if you look back at my work, there's always this kind of like, um, images that come back and haunt me throughout time, like rugs and beds and chairs. There's this um, familiarity with these objects and, you know, the actions that they contain. So, you know, from the Jewish Museum, I did this piece that's called Time Has No Shadows that dealt with the idea, I mean, I've been, since the piece at the Loja, I've been working with this idea of subjective time. And the Jewish Museum commissioned me to do this um, piece at the lobby of the museum. And the, originally the museum was a mansion that had a rug on it. And I was always fascinated by this idea of the mansion and the rugs. And I was always curious because, you know, like Freud and the museum, there's like all, in Jewish culture, there's so much rugs that apparently comes from a completely different culture, like which is Muslim. But as you go through it, uh, you learn a, a lot of things, you know. So I got th that most of these rugs are made by the Jewish diaspora as well, who went all over the Middle East and worked on them. And, you know, I got really interested in this idea of grounding, that rugs are first home, you know, as we're, when we're nomads. The rugs were the house. That's what you take with you when you place on the ground and it grounds you and makes a home. So that was one of the starting points. And the other one was the relationship with the watches that didn't measure any time. So we, I removed the hour hand from the watches so they were all teared and people could wind them. So there was like all these different time had, you know, time frames going on, so it was all these different subjective times. And of course, within the Jewish Museum context, uh, all the pocket watches, you know, uh, gained as a reference of the Second World War <coughs> and the concentration camps, where people were, you know, destituted of all their possessions. And you had piles of jewelry, piles of this, and piles of watches. So then, in there, it gains that connotation. That's one thing of my work. I mean, that work can uh, exist in another situation. It's going to have another set of meanings that are adhere to it. <coughs> so, what for this really comes from this exercise 
between, you know, my interest in this collective subjectivity, memory, and objects, and this idea of grounding. And it's also influenced by the show, because you kept asking me to show old things. <laughs> and I'm like, I That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and as an artist, I'm like, oh, I want to do a new gesture. I don't want to go back there. So I keep going looking at old catalogs and old catalogs. And I got to this very, very early piece that I did, early 90s, that were, was like a tablecloth with uh, embroidery hoops. And from there, I, you know, I started doing this whole new thing, which was like a playing with painting and objects and this mixture of abstraction, but also objects. So the show at Fortis, and I really want to, you know, I really like semantics and words and playing with the, the, the concept of the commonplace. Not only is a commonplace that you sit, but there's the banal, the banal, you know, what we think is banal, that sometimes are not. So there was a play of words, a play, and play with the objects, and, you know, the idea of grounding. And you called the shadow Lugar couple. Yes, it's called Commonplace. Hmm. <laughs> and my next show... Yes, what about your next show? Uh, well, that's another interesting thing here. That's a, I'm, I'm going to put like all the dirt on the table. We had this uh, really... We argued, discussed a lot of things in the show, and one of them was the title. Because I really want to call the show Neither Here Nor There. <laughs> and Julie and Vanessa thought they were kind of like negative meaning on it, and you know. I, and I don't quite see it that way. <laughs> because I think I'm neither here nor there. <laughs> you know? And I don't think immune is a negative thing, but so, just as a revenge to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> My next solo show at Alexander Gray was just sitting up from here. It's called Neither Here Nor There. <laughs> <laughs> I made them suffer a lot. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about what you might be working on for the next show? And this is in October, so this is coming up pretty soon. Mm, I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'd rather be a, keep a little of a mystery. Um, you know, I've been very, very fortunate to collaborate with many, many people through the years and, you know, come up with these projects that at first were completely insane, like the tapping. And, you know, find people that get enthusiastic about it and embark on this journey with me. So a lot of the projects you guys see in the show are the sort of, um, which I find exciting as well. It's not only about me, but it's a collaboration <coughs> with many, many people. And that is another thing that I think the work is about, it's translation. Because many of these ideas come out of my head, but they are translated through many, many people. And, you know, and that's another thing that I find interesting in the work. It, want, it becomes what it wants to be. I can try to force it, it away, force it, pull, you know, try, but in the end, it becomes what it wants to be. And there's all these people, there are intermediaries, you know, in making the work ex existing. Like even with the Taffy upstairs, I was just watching them and they're having so much fun with it and each one of them has become a sculptor for the day. 
you know. And then there's the collaborator who came up with like the way to do the pull chains or to make the you know the ballet of of um, the piece that we're going to show in Phoenix, and then of course uh, the film you're going to see here. It's uh, that's another thing being an artist that I find it's very endearing and but annoying at the same time. It's just when one of the pieces are very successful, how do you survive them? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like how do you want to ask you? Yeah, no, how do you move on? Because like the film we're showing here, it's like a film I did with an innocence and you know uh, a pleasure. I was, never did a movie, I'm not a filmmaker, you know, we just got together and produced this film. And it became like this kind of hit, you know, that everybody loves and everybody cries and it's just like scary. <laughs> Super scary because, you know, then I did another movie nobody wants to see it. <laughs> And, you know, that is true of many very successful artwork, works that you have to fight really hard not to be trapped by them. And, you know, and to bear the silence that comes after. <laughs> you know, when you do something that reaches so many people and it's so well received. That that is a big struggle, right. you know, and some people don't survive it. Becomes that which everyone compares you to. Or that that's yeah. the only thing they want to see. Yeah. So, you know, like finding ways to, you know, to surpass yourself it's, sometimes can be unbearable. And I think that's uh, true of every creative endeavor, not only visual art. You know, writers. I mean, that's we have so many writers that only wrote a book. I mean, the fear of the second one is so big, and that's you know, filmmakers. So, being a creative person has its advantages, but also has its traps. You know. Question, is it time to open up to the audience for questions? I think um, one of the great privileges of um, having Alessa here with us is that she has been such a vital presence um, here in the installation, which I um, was only uh, involved with part of because I was in, still in Phoenix for another show. But uh, we have the artist here who is uh, able to dialogue with the community. So perhaps we could take some questions from the audience. Or you can ask us too. Because there's one over there, there too. Uh, I think we have a microphone, so if you could. Uh, I can talk pretty loud. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that works. I have two questions. One for you why you wanted her to do her old pieces? <laughs> and then one for uh, you that how did you get started in doing your creativity? So, which one do you want to go? For? I, I, I go first. Okay. Okay. It's a Freudian problem. Um, I I grew up in uh, art is kind of like a family business. Okay. You know, my mother is a very. Um, she's actually in the same project. <coughs> she's at the Radical Women Show for the Hammer. So I grew grew up around art. My house was uh, upside down with filmmakers and actors and this and that. But being a good daughter, that was the last thing I wanted to be, <laughs> was an artist, you know. So I tried every detour imaginable not to be an artist. I went to architecture school, I did design. I did a bunch of things, and I finally ended up at the school in Sao Paulo, in Rio, that's called Parque Lage, which was a very influential art school at the time. And for painting, there was like the decade of painting, the 80s. 
And I would just sit there and have beers and look at all those painters and say, God, I'm never going to be able to do this, ever. So I started reading magazines and, you know, and I had all these male friends, artists, the, you know, for them, like art was about suffering and sweating and <laughs> doing a lot of heavy work and and I just started to get irritated, which is a usual sentiment with me. <laughs> and I decided to do very light work, and it was a public, um, there was an open call for a, a sculpture biennial that they would choose only 20 artists all over the country. So I decided that I was irritated with my friends that were sculptures and like to suffer, that was going to propose a project for the biennial. And I was luckily chosen, and I was one of the 20 artists that was chosen to do this biennial. And I went around with my project and got a lot of sponsorships to build it because it was quite ambitious. And somehow um, the whole thing went down the drain. The biennial never happened, but the sponsors never wanted the money back. So I got a sort of like a fellowship, a corporate fellowship. <laughs> And I worked in, then, you know, I started doing my work, uh, started doing like concept, more conceptual artwork uh, with the money and living with the money from this sponsorship. So that was the beginning. Can I ask a question about scale? We're, we're actually not finished answering. Oh, I don't think that. Um, but well, I don't want to hear from me at all. <laughs> <laughs> or was that in reference to what uh, Valeska just said about the public? I don't know. Answer, I don't okay. know. What was the other question? It was about scale or something. No, no, no. Oh, the, other, the, the other question, I believe, was to Vanessa and I about why we, we put you through the torture of wanting to see your older work. <laughs> and Because <laughs> that's their job. <laughs> No, it's, uh, well, as our, and I can speak to, <coughs> even as could maybe speak to something that she really wanted to see. I mean, it does really come down to, as a curator, what you really want to see. We're just being selfish, essentially, uh, but not really. I think that um, Valeska came from a certain moment in time in Brazil in the late 80s and, and early 1990s, uh, where there was a lot of uh, activity in Sao Paulo in, in particular with the uh, uh, regeneration of the Sao Paulo Biennale. And I do remember, um, I was in the art, barely in the art world at that time, and really wanting to go to Brazil. That was the place to go, and it was almost the beginning of um, the sort of uh, globalism uh, movement, if, for lack of a better word, in contemporary art. Um, but in any case, um, I think, some of the early works that I think you you were doing, Valeska, and, and this is what I wanted to say, to see are works that involve scent, uh, smell, and um, that was actually a pretty revolutionary at the time, um, not just regionally but also internationally, and um, it's of course those are the works you really didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And I get it. And so we came, we came up with a compromise, and Valeska was uh, graciously reconfigured um, the untitled preserve of the roses. Um, um, and then there's the uh, fainting couch. And then there's fainting couch, which was generously loaned to us uh, by the Phillips Collection, uh, which was really bold on their part because, um, as you might imagine, some of the work is quite delicate and a number of institutions just don't want to lend. Um, but in any case, I, I wanted to experience the, the, the scent, I wanted to experience those works that historically sort of helped put you on the map. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know you can lie on that couch. Please take your belts off. <laughs> yeah, we're, it's something we're not encouraging. <laughs> 
lie to Lee. So, and also too because the the um, we promised the Phillips we'd take extra care. That's why you'll see a guard in there. Um, it's, you know, watches, belts, anything like that. Um, I think somebody uh, also had some taffy and like, maybe put their hands on them. So you know, it, it, even though it is stainless steel, it does scratch. So um, you know, if you decide to do that, please. Uh, uh, I would just like to raise a point that I find very interesting because a lot of the work that I do it's uh, relational and it's interactive but then it's acquired by a museum or a collector who doesn't want anybody to interact with it so <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to handle this <laughs> like moving forward I feel very strange uh, you know because the same thing that attracted them to the work, it's what they don't want to happen with the work. So it seems to me to be a paradox. And maybe I'm, you know, I don't know. They're being perverse to me or I'm being perverse to them. Yeah. Well, it is work that is, uh, just being from an institution, it's difficult, um, you know, because you've also, you've, you want the piece to survive, and it's uh, uh, yeah, it's a it's a dilemma. What's yeah, it's a big dilemma. So we have a question here, and then if you don't mind, I'll come around with the microphone because that way your question will be part of the video that we're making, so that it will make sense when people hear the answers. They'll know what the question is. So, and Jenny had a question. I, I did want to ask you about uh, for Velasco about scale, uh, and as as a as an artist who studied. Uh, formally architecture and decided not to, you know, make buildings, uh, you know, it's, it's a very rigid discipline. I wondered if you could talk about this uh, sort of um, dis discontinuity between studying architecture and your um, interest in the domestic sphere, or this idea of repetition, of very poetic elements of like you were talking about rugs and chairs and even more romantic elements like roses or uh, the nostalgia of saltwater taffy or uh, if you could talk about sort of domesticity in relation to this idea of, of scale and what it means to sort of um, alter uh, the perception of scale in your work. Well, first of all, I think um, Scale is still present. I mean, uh, if I wasn't trained as an architect, I think I would have I produced a completely different type of work. You might not be very familiar. This, what we have here, it's kind of like pieces that are museum scale, but uh, throughout my career I have been doing quite um, big scaled projects, you know, like actually buildings. Uh, in Venice, in Mexico, so there is an architecture element on it. And my role, oh, I mean, actually, uh, one of the reasons I became an artist was through architecture. At the time when I was in school, I had the opportunity to host um, a bunch of architects from London, from the Architecture Association at the time, like Zaha did, and Peter Cook, that they were doing uh, just poetic architecture that had nothing to do with functionality, but more with the idea of a poetic space, or folly, you know, which is a building that has no reason to exist but the desire of whoever wants it.